Hey everybody, it is Marlon Gibbons here. How is everybody doing? I hope everybody's well. I'm just gonna jump straight into it. Today's topic, as you saw in the thumbnail, is not a topic that I had on the docket. It's kind of inspired from a lot of recent conversations as well as messages and, and DMs and, and comments in some of the videos. <laughs> so based on that, I kind of deemed it important enough to move up the line. So we're doing it today. And what the topic is about is the absolute basics. I'm going to scale away all the confusing stuff because I could easily make this really complicated, but I'm going to try and give you the basics. And that is if you're starting out in the sync licensing, library, production, music, publishing world, you create, produce, write music, and you want to get that music placed into television or media, and you want to maybe earn some royalties from that music. I'm going to give you some basic tips on where to start. We're going to treat this like it's day one. I'm going to try not to overload you with information and just give you the scaled back basics. So let's start with the who and the what, and then we'll talk about the how. The who, sometimes there's a lot of people involved, but the main parties are you, the content creator, the music creator, the music library slash publisher, and then the end user, the people that are licensing your tracks for their projects. The what is the catalog of licensable music for projects, media. And now we'll explain the how. Um, and I was thinking off camera, how do I explain this and make it really simple and understandable to somebody who's just new to the industry? And it's, it's actually quite challenging. So please bear with me and I'm gonna try and keep it as simple as I can. You create music, we already identified that. You form a relationship with a music library you, you find a library that you want to work with, you solicit or submit to them. If they accept your music, you will sign a contract agreeing to their terms. This will protect both of you. And then going forward, they will represent a catalog of music. Obviously it won't be just your music, a catalog of music. That music will be available to their, their consuming public, the, the industry, the people that will license your music in their projects. And I say license because you're not selling, or the music libraries are not selling your music. They're selling a license to have your music used in these projects. What your hope is, is that it's a big network, a big TV show, documentary, movie even, that is gonna use your music in broadcast. If it's broadcast, that will generate revenue. Revenue will eventually be picked up if all the administrative components and procedures are done properly and in place. A whole other video. But eventually, months down the road, what you have coming to you will make its way to your pro. Your pro is your performance rights organization. You've heard of BMI, CSAC, ASCAP, SOCAN here in Canada, uh, PRS. These are organizations that look out for the music creator and make sure that you get paid when your music is broadcast or performed. But but basically when there's monies generated from your music, they look after you to try and make sure that you get paid. That's rights managed. The opposite of that is royalty free. I'm not gonna talk too much about royalty free because I don't do a lot of royalty free music myself. I support it 100% and I have colleagues and friends that, that do quite well um, creating royalty free music. It can be a lot more frequent and if you have enough tracks out there, it can be quite substantial. But wanting to keep this simple, just know that there's two forms, two main paths you can go down, which is rights managed or there's royalty free. So now that we know, you know, a very basic model of how it works and what you need to do, find a library to place your tracks with, it's, it's easy, right? It's probably the number one question I get. No, it, it is. It's the number one question I get in all the comments, the, the direct messages, the just messages in general is which libraries do I submit my music to? Whose door do I knock on? Who do I solicit to? What are the best libraries? They want to name a, a company. They want to know who to go to. Um, and it's a fair question. I, and I can put myself in that position and, and understand why, why you would think that's a valid question. Uh, and in fact, it is a valid question, if, especially if you're starting out and you, you're still not sure of 
who is who and, and how the whole model works. I know it's a popular question, not just on my channel. I know other YouTubers that, that talk about the same kind of thing as me. It's a common question amongst them too. And as evidenced by all the videos I've ever put out, I genuinely do want to help you, but you're not going to get a list of, of libraries to hit up from me right now. <laughs> Keeping in theme to this video, the basic reason is that you are all so different from one another in the music you produce. Some of you are strict electronic, some of you are hip hop, some of you are rock, folk, country, some of you are vocalists, some of you are guitar players, some of you, it's just endless. And there is no one library fits all. Even though I don't have a list to give you or sell you of libraries that you should hit up, I think I can still help you. That is if you're willing to put in a bit of work. If you're willing to put in a bit of work, then I can certainly give you some free advice to help better your odds. And that is you should create a checklist before you start looking for libraries. And that is understand the style of music that you write. Uh, because not every library is going to market, push, promote, represent, or have the clientele that consumes that kind of music. So if at all possible, you can try and look for libraries that either specialize in your style of production, or at the very least have a large portion of their catalog that is active with that style of music. That's important because you don't want to get your music into a library where you have maybe an exclusive contract and it just sits on the shelf collecting dust. So if the question comes to you, in fact, I'm asking it right now um, for you to answer yourself, what kind of music do you write? If there was an opportunity on your, on your doorstep tomorrow and you needed to answer the question first, what style of music do you write? Could you answer it? Because understanding the style of music you write and all the unique traits your music may have will help you refine who you want to work with as far as music libraries go. So that's a really important first step is understanding your music. And it's also a big part of why uh, YouTubers such as myself and others can't just give you a list of libraries to hit because many of those libraries may not be relevant to your music at all or, or vice versa. Another important point to consider is whether you want your music to be represented exclusively or non-exclusively. You'll hear those terms, exclusive and non-exclusive. And what they mean is, are you going to enter into a contract with a library where only that library can have represent the tracks you've written? You can't take them and put them into another library. If you go non-exclusive, then yes, you can put your music into a few other libraries, so long as that they're all non-exclusive and they're all okay with it. Because again, I remind you, you're signing contracts. You as an artist can work with as many libraries as you want, but each track is exclusive to that specific library that you've signed the contract with, if that, if that makes sense. And while I won't get into it in this video, there are benefits to both those models. I'm not favoring one over the other. So after you've hit up Google and it throws up a ton of libraries, start clicking on them, read their profile, read their about section, go, go straight to their about section. Find out how long have they been around? Have they just started up? And that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. There are a lot of new libraries that have some heavy hitters because maybe some of the staff have come from the industry and have some great connections, but it's something for you to be aware of. How long have they been around? How big are they and how big is their catalog? Again, not necessarily a bad or good thing. So it's just something for you to be aware of and consider who you want to be working with because it is a business relationship. Don't just throw your tracks in a library and, and walk away. When you're looking at libraries to see if they might be a fit for you, what you want for your music, consider how big are they? Who are the clients? Are they getting placed? What are other people saying about them on forums? And, and, and you know, if you Google uh, reviews on whatever that library is, their contract, as I said, exclusive, non-exclusive. Can you communicate with them? If you phone them, will they answer the phone, answer your questions? I, I've said a lot of this several times on other videos, but I think I definitely think it's worth repeating and mentioning. My, my personal approach I'll share with you has always been to have a personal professional relationship with any publisher that, that I work with. Basically just learn as much as you possibly can about any library that you're considering working with or that you're, you're interested in knowing more about. 
do the research. I can't stress that enough. Learn about them. And then if they still seem like somebody or, or a company that you want to work with, contact them. Just reach out to them. If you have any questions, ask them the questions. If you're going to solicit to them, then, then solicit to them. But a golden piece of advice that I would give to anybody starting out is know the company as much as you possibly can before you begin to enter into a relationship with them. Another really common question is, what do I send them? How many tracks do I send them? How do I send the tracks? My answer, much like I, I just said, is go on their website. Most of the time, they will tell you, um, A, if they're open to submissions, because a lot of them have certain times of the year that they're open to submissions and other times they're not. If they're open to submissions, they'll tell you, most of the time, they'll tell you exactly how to send it to them and what, what file format, how many tracks, um, some might want Dropbox, some might want a streaming link, um, some might very explicitly say don't send attached files, some might not mind that. Um, the point is most library websites will tell you exactly how to submit to them and what to submit to them. So by all means, if you want to start that relationship off well, respect their wishes and send them. If they say three tracks, don't send them 10 tracks, send them three tracks. Again, trying to keep this simple. Uh, another really popular common question is, um, you know, hey, I write a lot of different styles of music. What should I send them? Send them really well produced music. That's your best bet. It doesn't matter as much what style. Speaking mostly from experience and library owners that I've, I've spoken with, they want to hear your production chops. They want to hear the quality of your music before they, they enter into a contract or, or a agreement with you. Think of it like an interview. You want to sell yourself and the quality of, of your work and the value you bring to the table. But instead of a face to face interview where they read your resume and ask you questions, it, it's those tracks. They're, they're listening to those tracks to kind of assess the, the viability of or value of getting into a, a relationship. But if you feel that you produce six, seven, eight different styles really well, pick the one, maybe two that you produce the best, hands down, and that will give you the best odds of getting it. Uh, a lot of the viewers that have subscribed to this channel for a long time have heard me talk about this a lot, uh, and that is, it, when you're communicating with a library, especially for the first time, you want to make a really good first impression. Brevity. So be super brief. Uh, don't don't write a huge long email with a big bio. They may have a form on their website that basically just lets you give them your contact information and a couple tracks and, and no explanation, which is fine in those cases. But if it's a music library that you do have a, a chance to correspond with, just keep it brief. Try and provide value, show them or explain to them what you believe you could bring to the table. It's always helpful to try and put yourself in their position. And if it were somebody coming to you that had interest in working with you, you want to see what's of value. Why should you work with them? Why, why would you give them a chance, right? So just try and put yourself in that position. Again, be brief, be polite. Don't use slang, use spell check. And somewhere in that communication, whether it's phone or email, show them that you know about them or the projects they've been working on or maybe recent um, successes they've had or their company has had. Show that you know about them, that you've, you've done a bit of research and you have some interest in what they are doing. It's their company, so it only serves you well to show interest in that company in this, in this opening introduction to them. Another, I guess, gold nugget piece of advice if you have co-producers or, or co-writers on a track and you submit that track to a music library, I can't stress enough. I, I keep saying that, I know, but <laughs> these are all important points. Note that in the schedule. They'll ask, in most cases, they'll ask what percentage of the song is owned, what, what percentage of publishing and, and writing you own in that track. If there's co-writers and producers and they have a stake in that, identify that. There's no quicker way to kill a relationship, not to mention potentially introduce legal issues and matters um, by somebody making a claim on a track that you said was yours and really wasn't in the hopes that maybe no one would find out. Just imagine an old bandmate finding out that a track that you submitted got placed on a big network television show and they helped write it and you didn't acknowledge 
that. Um, make sure that you're honest about your shares. If, if you produce everything solely yourself, that's fine. Just always be as honest and forthcoming with that kind of stuff as, as possible. All right, so I said I was gonna try to not overload you with information. So I have two more simple, quick pieces of advice. The first one is be patient, have patience. Um, know that it's normal it's part of the game it's part of this industry that things take a long time to happen like even at the upper stages of the game it still takes a long time it, it, things can happen a little more frequently because you've made the relationships you've built the catalog everything is kind of in place to help things happen quicker but if you're at the beginning of the game and you're just getting into music licensing things take a long time and that is to say hearing back from the libraries can take a long time once you get into a library it can take a long time to get your music placed in a TV show. Once that happens, it can take a long time before you see any money from that placement. And each of those things I just said all have independent reasons for taking so long. Be patient. You're not the only person who has to wait for these things to happen. It is a long game. Lots of people fall out or quit or give up before they see any, any success because they want quick success. And there's nothing wrong as, as human beings with, with wanting quick success or wanting things to happen quickly. All I can tell you is that it's a long game. I don't, I don't have any colleagues or know of anybody that it just happened like that and all of a sudden they're, they're successful and things are just happening you know, in their favor and it was just a quick overnight thing. The, the sync licensing music TV placement thing is just is not something that, that that happens quickly and overnight. And the last thing I'll tell you, um, and I, I speak from experience with this one as well, I know tons of other friends, colleagues, and, and other people just in the industry um, that have experienced this. It's just something that happens and it's not a slight against you, it's just that it's how the industry operates. Sometimes you'll submit to a library and you won't hear anything back for weeks, um, possibly months. Some libraries will have a disclaimer or an explanation saying that if they don't uh, feel your stuff is right for their library, they may not get back to you. They may not let you know. You have to accept that that's just their policy. That's their procedure. Many libraries are inundated with submissions and solicitations and just simply don't have time to get back to everybody. You also have to consider that from a business perspective, that's not value added time for them to get back. It's polite and it helps you, helps ease your mind and, and give you a, a, a resolve, a resolution. But for them, it's not value added. It's not that they forgot about you, missed you, uh, overlooked you. It could be a million reasons why they choose to pass over your tracks. Um, try not to take it personally. I, I know that's easier said than done. Many of those reasons could have little to do with the quality of your work or, or how great it is. It might be amazing, fantastic, just not necessarily fit for what they're looking for uh, or what their direction is at that time. I don't mean to make excuses for you or them. I'm just saying that try not to get too bent out of shape if you don't hear anything back. Um, or in fact, you do hear back and they don't accept your tracks. If they say, we may not get back to you for six to eight weeks, don't email them after three weeks. There's nothing stopping you from shopping to a few different publishers or as many publishers as you want. And then of course, depending on who gets back to you and when they get back to you, you, you make that decision based on your wants and your needs. Uh, I can't tell you who to sign with or who ultimately you should put your tracks with. Just saying, rather than focus on one and wait and wait and possibly never hear anything and then those tracks just sit there not getting licensed or not getting promoted or shopped. It might be in your interest to, after a few weeks, shop that, those tracks to another publisher, or as I said, to a few different publishers and whoever gets back to you first, um, if you so choose, you can go with, with them. But my point is you may wait weeks, if not months, before you hear anything back. And it's very common that you will hear something a couple months down the road good or bad, whether they accept you or not. But know that that's how the industry operates, that it's not uh, uncommon. So I hope some of that was, was helpful and I didn't overload you with information. I know that a lot of my 
longtime subscribers have maybe made a bit more progress or further into the industry uh, and that this would be very basic and fundamental to those of you that are in the industry. I, my goal is to help everybody. I just can't do that with one video. So kind of have to target these videos to different groups of you depending on where you are in the industry. I hope that's cool. Thank you everybody so much for tuning in. I appreciate the support. If you have any questions, throw them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer. And by all means, anybody that can answer any of the questions that get thrown in the comments by all means everybody feel free to help each other out if you're further down the industry um, and you see a question there and you feel you can answer it and help the whole idea of this channel is not me talking to you it's it's us as a community so thank you so much don't forget to connect with me on my other social media stuff and uh and we'll catch you next week cheers friends